Hello. Hassan. Uh, madam, Peta, Pesna, Madam. Yeah, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, you're audible now. You're audible now. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Good morning once again. And uh, sorry for the uh, sorry about the technical issues. I welcome you all for this webinar on how to publish a high impact research journal. And uh, I welcome our resource person, Dr. Sayes, for this session. And I would like to introduce him to this gathering, Dr. Sayed has completed his Doctor of Philosophy from Applied Sciences Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, Melbourne City Campus, Victoria, Australia, between 2015 and 19. He has pursued his Master of Technology from, uh, in Nanotechnology from Amity University, India. And uh, he has done his Master's thesis research at Center for Nanofibers and Nanotechnology, National University of Singapore, Singapore, and BTEC from Anna University in uh, Electronics and Communication Engineering. He has a uh, very rich research work experience. He has he's a he was research fellow Applied Sciences Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT, Melbourne City Campus, Victoria, Australia, and. Uh, he, he is a research fellow between uh, 2013 to 14 December uh, in Material Science Engineering Department, Abdullah University of Science and Technology, Saudi Arabia. And uh, he was an associate uh, research assistant, Department of Physics, University of California, Berkeley, USA. And he was an associate researcher, Material Sciences Division, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, United States of America, between May 2012 and November 2012. And he has a, a rich teaching experience also in uh, as teaching assistant and uh, demonstrator in applied chemistry, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, Melbourne City Campus, Victoria, Australia. And uh, he is a co-founder of Big and Fast Private Limited India, and this uh, company was started from in the year 2018. And uh, this business is in the spectrum of cybersecurity by generating dynamic passwords and encryption keys in a user-friendly method to perform highly secure transactions. And he has the uh, very uh, rich publications in record in his uh, profile. And uh, he has... Uh, uh, he is a receiver of many awards. To mention a few, uh, he has received the Australian Global Distinguished Talent Award 2020 from the Australian Home Affairs Australia, National Science Foundation USA and Georgia Institute of Technology grant to travel to 18th International Meeting on Chemical Sensors, Montreal, Canada. And he is the one among Australia's top 20 young innovators at the Falling Walls Australian National Finals, chosen uh, jointly chosen by Australian Academy of Science, Falling Walls Foundation, and Embassy of the Federal Republic, Germany, Canberra, Australia. And he has won the three minutes thesis competition uh, from RMIT University, and he is the champion and people's choice winner, Melbourne, Australia, in the year 2018. He is an Asia Pacific finalist, three minute thesis competition at the University of Queensland, Australia. And he was received a travel grant for a leadership uh, workshop to Barcelona, Spain. And again in the year 2017, also, he was the People's Choice winner uh, for uh, RMIT University Redback Innovation Challenge. And uh, he has uh, present around the world competition Victorian champion and one among six Australia's best science communicators, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. And uh, 
he has received various other travel grants and he has uh, uh, awarded the academic excellence alliance travel award to uk and uh, he has won the molecular scientist grant to work at lawrence berkeley national lab material science division usa and uh, indian republic the gold medal for education from federal government of tamil nadu india and uh, he is also uh, received the rotary club significant achievement award for aids awareness campaign in india 2009 so this is uh, uh, his profile runs uh, very long and i have uh, you know briefed and uh, given you the salient points of his resume so i thanks uh, once again uh, sayed for um, accepting our invitation and uh, um, come uh, joined in this webinar to present uh, and i hope all the audiences uh, have uh, enjoyed the session and uh, they benefit from this and i thank uh, our school dean and also our dean academic research for uh, helping us to organize this webinar and uh, now i request uh, dr sayed to continue his session thank you one and all uh very good morning everyone such a pleasure uh, having you here on board uh, thank you tarni madam for your extraordinary introduction i'm quite overwhelmed by your warm uh, communications um i am basically from rameshwaram where dr apj abdul kalam is from and you all know his motto for life is service through education uh i'm quite inspired by his uh, motto and i thought i should also give back to the society in any capacity i can the best service you can do to education is to share knowledge so that is my intention i have almost a 10 years of research experience and i had the opportunity to work with various esteemed institutions around the globe and an amazing incredible professors from whom i not just learned research but but also uh, the code of conduct of research and also quite a lot of techniques to publish um articles and stuff so today my entire session will be based on uh sharing my knowledge and experience how to write an article purely from my perspective and also the learnings i had from my seniors and friends and professors um uh tarni madam uh, extensively introduced me thank you very much for that so here's a list of publications of me Uh, ma'am is the presentation of uh, can you see the presentation i think now you have closed yeah uh, yeah go to slide show so do you see two screens yes. now yes yes mm. i hope it's okay now okay here is my extensive uh, presentation i have uh, several publications in applied material chemistry uh, american chemical society journal of material chemistry um my area of research is uh, gas sensing so there's plenty of papers in sensors and actuators as well and there are several manuscripts under communication okay we all talk about high impact fa uh, factor papers why do we need to publish a high impact papers what happens when our papers never get cited by others so the whole point is to share our scientific excellence with the fraternity and community so that they get benefited a research that is not acknowledged is a research that's not done so this is something uh, professor michael f gromi from university of california berkeley where i did my honors program always tell me a research that's not appreciated acknowledged or used is not a research that's done so can we ignore impact fact factors i don't think so we cannot uh, exclude impact factors at all the first reason is being say for example when i was in my undergrad i had two international publications one is in china the other one is from university of uh, uh, cambridge which actually got me the prestigious international 
uh, scholarship uh, to do my master's thesis in National University of Singapore. During my time at National University of Singapore, I published a few high impact papers. I was working with Professor Sriram Ramakrishna, one of the most cited and eminent professors in the field of uh, material science, which got me a few papers, which acquired me a grant to work in uh, University of California, Berkeley. There in Uni University of California, Berkeley, I had an opportunity to publish a few papers, which got me the Academic Excellence Alliance there I published a few papers, which got me the most prestigious Australian government's Australian Research Council scholarship. So it's a hierarchy. It's it's a sequence of process. So it's really important to have high. Say, for example, I'm writing few grants and they will check my track of record. And there's high possibility. There's always the award of this grant to me. and when you publish more, you go to really high impact conferences where you can able to make scientific collaborations. Um, again, to become an advisor to the government, to become an editor for a journal, to be selected as a speaker for a scientific conference, to be a member of a scientific commission or to evaluate grants, all you need is really, really high impact papers. So. The whole point of this uh, webinar today is to make you acknowledge this importance and also give you some tips how to publish some uh, high impact fa factor papers. Okay, you all are very enthusiastic in doing research. You know whether we understand the literature or not, we jump into the lab, or uh, we try and do all sort of uh, technical things um, to accumulate data. But do we really start to write uh, papers? This is where the real procrastination starts. Uh, procrastination is a process of postponing things. But listen to me, today is your day. You will take all these knowledges from me and definitely start to write all your data into paper. So do not procrastinate. Now, here's the basic concepts of publishing a paper. First thing, you got to understand what is the problem you are going to deal with. Number two, what are what other people in your field of research have done? What is your hypothesis? What are you going to do differently? If you understand this four points, four mantras, I think the, the paper will write itself. Number one, identifying the problem making ourselves aware what others have done in the problem, what I am going to do differently, and how I'm going to do differently. So make this clear, the paper is there. Okay, I talked about high impact papers. You know, I talked about a researcher who, who would become renowned and different from others who get cited. If you know, there's hundreds and thousands of papers published every single day. Trust me, every single day, hundreds and thousands. Do all our papers get acknowledged? Sometimes not. So do all our papers get cited? Mostly not. So the whole idea is to publish ourselves as a person of renowned research so that people cite our papers and get benefited from our research. The, the most important thing about citing your paper Say, for example, I have done some mistakes in the past and I have done some re uh, good research. When someone cites your paper, they don't do it again. They don't waste their time. They don't waste their resources. So this and also um, you, you pass on the knowledge to the future generation. This is the most important thing about um, uh, citations. OK, only when your paper is high impact, people like to cite it. When you publish your papers on a low quality or a low impact journals, people doesn't really look at it. They don't like to cite it. Here is the first, first thing about your research. You should be the master of your literature. Say, for example, my first year of my PhD was completely dedicated to reading. Reading, 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 every reading, anytime reading. At the end of my first year, I was sort of knowing what are, who all my competition, which are the research groups that are publishing papers like me, 
what are the work that's been done and that's when i was discussing with my supervisors that oh here's the available literature what i'm going to do different then i started proposing few ideas and i also want you uh, all to aware either you are a professor or assistant professor associate or a research scholar or a master student keep one thing in mind you are completely responsible for your literature survey nobody else is responsible for your literature survey uh, let me uh, share a very interesting case with you uh, that happened in america uh, a student she filed a case on her supervisor for giving wrong instructions and misguiding her with the literature and this became really a famous case uh, back then but the court said in the verdict your professor has 10 other students he has a lump of teaching work and administrative work so you should be the one who, as a phd student should have identified your problem and the case was in the favor of the professor so you can't blame anybody you know when it comes to your literature survey you sit and read you dedicate time to read um that is the most basic step of your research okay now this is one question everyone ask me how to choose a journal to study number one you choose your core journals if you are doing research in photovoltaics or in uh, catalysis or in gas sensing or microbiology or vaccine related research research uh, there's always your own core journals where people really try hard to publish in that just because that's where everyone reads it number 2 what sort of audience you are focusing say for example my research was about how to diagnose diabetes from human breath um it involves gas sensing it involves photoelectronics it involves uh material science so now i know these are the three people that i want to share my knowledge with and also uh this is diagnosis based journals as well um so by then at the end of first two months of your phd you should have identified your core journals and what sort of audience you are focusing the third one there are certain journals that you will enjoy in singapore in professor shriram ramakrishna's group we had a group meeting once in a week everyone has to give a summary of what they have done for the week to the group leaders then to the professor it's like a two hours good meeting on a friday evening so all the phd students were allowed to present for 5 minutes what they have done in the week what are uh, the certain papers that they read what they understood from it it's like a snapshot of uh, a tantalizing tidbit uh, of their entire week so i strongly insist all the professors to to start this culture in your college or your research organization once in a week one hour of meeting uh all your group members come together share knowledge of what they have done in the week what they have read um this will also induce quite a lot of uh collaborations bit between the group oh i have synthesized this material i have done this uh do you think we can do something together and uh see how it works so this sort of conversations would pop in so start this culture in your college from now the journal club okay how to read a paper this is also something we lag what we do 8 years ago what i used to do is i sit and read the entire paper uh spending the whole day at the end of the day i found out that paper has no relevance with me so this is a basic mistake phd students does it um but there is a way to eliminate this keywords first check if the keyword of the paper that you have found is relevant to you if it is not relevant to you still we give the benefit of doubt to that paper you read the abstract this is where a real no no if that abstract has nothing to do with you i think throw the paper paper out of your window then in case if that paper makes some sense to uh, your research read the conclusion then read the last part of the introduction that's where the people say uh, oh this is what i'm trying to do then go check the experimental setup see if that experiments would be relevant and could be useful for you after checking all these boxes finally 
you read the results and discussion. You know, you have complete rights to stop reading at any stage of this if that paper makes no sense to your research. So first the keywords, then the abstract, conclusion, last part of the introduction, experiments and results and discussion. Okay, now, what should we look in a literature? I would like to share this with all of you because I know the audience that I have today is mostly from the Indian subcontinent um, and also from Africa and the Middle East. Uh, the first thing, the first thing that you should look for in a literature is the mechanism or a phenomena. You know, we receive quite a lot of papers from the Indian subcontinent where people just explain graphs. They say, oh, I did this and the efficiency increased from 30% to 50%. But why? Why did it increase? This is the most important question that we need to address. You have to identify this while you read. Uh, in your, Like I said, in the first year of PhD, you make sure you identify all sort of phenomena. For example, um, uh, let me put a random example here, launching a rocket. It could have five or six different ways of doing it. Make sure you all know, not just the name of the five or the six phenomena, but how the phenomena actually works. This is where the high impact factor papers stand separately and loud. Um, so we all got to identify the mechanism while you read and make sure you take notes of it, identify those papers because throughout your research, while you're writing your paper, you will say, oh, this person has done all six different types of uh, launching a rocket and this is my new idea. So those papers are, are your core papers. You got to print them and chuck on your wall near the computer. Okay, I spoke about what to look into the literature while you're reading a literature. This is uh, one of my publication in Applied uh, up ACS, American Chemical Society. So what I did is I synthesized zinc titanate nanoarrays and I subjected that material to three different conditions. One is shining a light on the top, heating the material to 350 degrees centigrade, and also applying a bias to the material from 0.1 to 9 volt. That's when I was testing my acetone gas, how these materials um, uh, uh, sense acetone. So I have subjected to four different conditions. One is the light on the top, then the bias, the temperature, and I'm also passing acetone. So now, what we see from the papers from the Indian subcontinent, they say, oh, I have done all these things, and when I increase the bias from 0.1 to 9 volt, you can see the graph, the response increases. Um, this is not something a high-impact journal will expect that from you. That journal will ask you, when the light interact with your material, what happens in your material? When you heat your material, what happens to the material? What sort of thermodynamic uh, uh, material signs or electronic band, all these changes? When you apply bias from 0.1 to 9 volt, what happens to your material? And what happens when all these three conditions exist together and also they are separate together? Now, what happens when you pass acetone into your material when all these conditions are on, when all these conditions are off? So imagine this itself a quite extensive literature survey. You got to understand the interaction of light with the material, interaction of temperature with the material, and interaction of bias with the material, and interaction of gas with the material. So this is what you got to look into your literature. Uh, probably you're from a different field, microbiology or... Um, you know, physics, chemistry, zoology, botany, what could be your research, it doesn't matter. You got to understand the basic crux of your problems. Um, so look for mechanisms. This is really, really important. Okay, now the journal club. When I did my PhD, my supervisors made sh make sure that there is a 10 minutes presentation every week. I had five different supervisors. So I met all of them for 10 minutes for a short discussion of that week. And there were six major presentations that 
when I walked in, my supervisor, when I met my supervisor for the first time, they said, in two months time, we want to give you a one hour presentation of what you have read in this two months. Then you will do this six times in this year so that we make sure you understand your literature well. And the presentation was just one hour. Later, we had really furious discussions about my literature, their concerns, and there are some core papers where my supervisors read along with me to make sure that I have understood things rightly or I didn't misinterpret things on my own. I think the, if you nurture your students in the first year or the students who are listening to me, try and practice this in the first year, your PhD is literally finished. 90% of your PhD is finished. Um, so I spend quite a lot of this time to make sure uh, you all have a detailed understanding of literature. Literature is everything. If you don't understand literature, there is no point of doing research. Now, I spoke about literature, literature, literature. Now, how we are going to collect your literature, how we are going to organize your literature. Here is two very effective tools. One is mentally, the other one is EndNote. EndNote is a paid software, but it's not very expensive. It's uh, 10 American dollars for a year, uh, but mentally it's a free software. So I'm going to show you my EndNote right now and what all I do with my EndNote. Here's my EndNote just for one of my research, not for all. I have 18 different endnotes for different literature surveys of me. This endnote is my gas sensing literature endnote. You can see I have put the books, proposals, survey, everything in one. Now, say for example, I'm writing a paper. I open my word. And I want to cite these three papers into my thing. I choose them. And then I go to EndNote and say insert selected references. Here you can see the references sit here right there. And at the end of your paper, you get all your references. Say, for example, I, do, I don't want one of my reference. Or I want to add another reference now. I go to EndNote again and select them and come back here to my um thing and say endnote insert endnote you can see again they are added now say for example you submitted your paper to one journal and it got rejected unfortunately we don't like to hear this word rejection but you have to change the reference format for one paper to another because every journal has a different referencing style by using this EndNote, just by clicking the different format, it automatically changes to the requirement of the another journal. Mentally does exactly the same. So I insist all of you today to download Mentally. And there are so many videos on YouTube that explains you how to use Mentally. Um, learn that and put all your reference into that. It helps you immensely. Uh, uh, you all can see that I have all my uh, papers lined up in different places. And just for my gas sensing literature, I have 701 papers downloaded. And most of the papers are read, and some of the papers are skimmed through. Some of the papers are used as reference for my research. So I hope this will be uh, a tool of immense help for you. OK, now. Um, what we're going to do is to discuss more, there's an option called Academia where you can choose your area of research and go register your details, like your email address. What happens is whenever a new paper published in your area of research, they automatically push an email to you and you can read it. Sometimes that paper could be of relevance to you and sometimes it may not be relevant to you. Again. This has to do more with your literature survey part. I subscribe to Academia 
especially those professors who do research in my area of research. Every time they published a paper, I immediately got a notification and I started reading it. So I made sure I'm not doing a similar research like what they do. And I, I'm also aware of what they are doing. So please, today, register all of you to Academia. Okay, so I spoke quite extensively about the importance of um, a literature survey. If you have done a really strong literature survey for the first year, you will identify your research question. At the end of first year, you will have an idea what all the research that's done in your area, what is the aim of my thesis, what all I am going to do, what are my experimental setup, because your experimental setup depends again on the facilities you have. Um, so you can really come to a realistic ground. If you don't do a good literature survey, you will never identify your research question and you will be digging a random, um, um, random research, which you might find out that someone has done that research already 30 years ago or 20 years ago. So identifying your research question is a very important task at the end of your first year of your research. And professors, assistant professors, I insist you asking this question to your students every three months, have you identified research question? What is your, the nature of your problem? What are the setups? You know, in the first year of PhD, you can't really push them to ask, you know, answer these questions readily, but slowly you remember, you make them remember that they got to identify the research objective. Now, identifying research questions is as important. Identifying your competition is also very important. Say, for example, you are someone who does research on COVID-19 vaccination. Make sure you know what are the other research groups or research organizations who does research in COVID-19. Um, maybe you might be thinking that you're doing something different, but the same research group who has a bigger experimental setup and larger funding like Britain or America or somewhere in China or Japan, um, they would have also done what you have done your main experiment could be their very basic experiment. So it is really, really important to identify who are your competitors and make sure um, you check on them once in a week. I always used to spy on my um, uh, competitors every single, every single week. Trust me, every Friday evening, my job in the last one hour of four to five, is to go into the websites and see whether they have done something different or whether they are doing something what I'm doing. And there's other thing, I will talk from a reviewer's perspective uh, later in terms of identifying your competition. Okay, let me summarize what we discussed. We did a very extensive literature survey. We have identified our research questions. We're also spying on um, or uh, competitions. Now, I, I'm sure you all know this uh, man. He looks funny, but he's not a funny man. He is a father of a lot of the inventions that are rolling around us, Albert Einstein, Dr. Uh, Sir Albert Einstein. Um, every time you see Dr. Albert Einstein, that is a reviewer's perspective. I will talk from a reviewer's perspective. Okay, when you do experiments, make sure you exploit your potentials. Say for example, like I told you in my experiments, I was using 0 0.1 to 9 volt and I was applying a bias to my material. You know what happened? When I uh, submitted this paper to Journal of Material Chemistry, the first question they asked me, what happens to your material if you apply 10 volts, 15 volts, 20 volt, 30 volt? So, I was certain that they will ask this. My supervisors were certain they will ask this. So while I was doing my experiments, not just, I didn't stop at 0.9 volt. I made sure I tested 10 until 50 volt, until my circuit got burnt. So I had all these results with me and I was ready to answer my reviewer on first hand. You know how uh, troublesome, tiring it, it is to set up 
a research, a research setup again. You know, you stop your experiments and you feel you're so satisfied and exhausted. And suddenly you think, oh God, you know, I got to redo these experiments. Now I have to bring all my experiment setups together. This is the most annoying and inefficient way of doing research. Make sure when you do, uh, when you assemble all your research setup, you get everything, the best. You, you drag out of everything, you sponge out of everything, put it in any English context, you have all the data ready so that you don't have trouble uh, with your reviewers. <coughs> uh, logbook, you know, this was uh, when I was very young. I was uh, 21 years old when I was in National University of Singapore, uh, eight, nine years before. Um, this is how I used to record all my experiments, have a logbook, Today, in the digital world, you can do things in a very different way. Um, I ask my students to write email every single week of what they have done, including the the amount of chemicals that they used, the amount of uh, the equipments that they used. But this was me eight years before. But if you like to do this style, make sure you can also do that. Make sure you don't lose this logbook or someone steal this from you. Um, so logbooks are very important when it comes to research to record. We might think I will remember everything and put things into my paper. That no way happens. Okay, so we have done our literature survey. We have done, we have identified our research questions. We also have uh, done all the experiments in every possible way. This is one confusion. People from the Indian subcontinent and Africa and Middle East always go through. What is plan A, what is plan B, and what is a conference? And what is P1, P2? I will explain you this right now. Always, when you do research, make sure you run experiments in two different styles or three different styles, or run two exactly different experiments at the same time. It is hard, but if you manage, if you manage to read literature well, certainly you can do it. Say, for example, I know a friend who does um, um, antenna design or uh, a mechatronics design. He used all sort of trans, uh, transistors available, different transistors available, just to accumulate three different data. You know, this is, this is called a high impact research, just because when you write a paper, you will have three different perspectives and three different uh, research modules. And there's one mistake people do is, they have produced a really amazing results, but instead of communicating that to a high impact journal, sometime they look uh, a conference abroad a big deal. Trust me, conferences are important, but uh, high impact papers values much more than a conference. Uh, nobody cites your conference uh, proceeding. Uh, there's not much credits being given for your conference in the field of research when it when it in comparison to high impact papers. So let me tell you a very interesting story. Um, it's, it was from Bangladesh. I was uh, organizing a conference and I received really amazing, amazing paper which would go into a high impact journal uh, for my conference. So what happened was um, I asked him, I replied back to him and I asked him like, uh, sir, this is a fantastic work. This should go to a high impact journal. He said, no, I like to visit Australia. Um, yes, visiting Australia, going to a conference is better, but do you want to compromise one of your finest research? Uh, he was still, still uh, you know, uh, convinced and he came down here and he literally compromised his uh, conference uh, important publication data. So this is where people, you got to be very careful. Uh, make sure you publish your really low impact work in conferences. Like I said, uh, if you're doing uh, COVID-19 research, publish all your main research into a conference, uh, sorry, uh, high impact papers. If there are any small supporting experiments that's been left, which can be associated with your major research, put that into a conference. Okay, now what is P1 and P2? Patents, you know, if you don't do an extensive literature survey, you will never understood 
how and what is the process of a patent you will not able to you will not able to come to a conclusion that is your idea is original can this be patent so this you will come to this conclusion only when you have done a really extensive research literature survey and suddenly you find some extraordinary outcomes of your research then you think i'm going to publish uh, rather than publishing a paper i'm going for a patent and again when it comes to phd students uh, it's okay for professors and uh, uh, research industry when it comes to phd students a patent process it is always a longer one uh, but you might need some papers to get through your phd in that case what you can do is you can slowly work on your patent and keep that so confidential and work on an alternative project uh, which is very close to your research to aim for publications and graduate so this is um, a one mistake some people do they cling to uh, patents and they don't concentrate on publications or a thesis which is also not a good idea that's that's why we see there's quite a lot of people doing phd for 8 to 9 years or 10 years um so please understand this difference between plan a plan b uh, what is a conference paper p1 and p2 i'm going to put this to you in a really funny way so that it stands in your mind this plan a and plan b is a basic uh, uh necessities like food and water so that we publish high impact papers and graduate conference is like going for a cinema you know uh you go there you enjoy your time you see people but you don't put your important materials into that conference paper and what is p1 and p2 when you have something really precious like a gold or a diamond you know uh, which is going to help you on a longer term you preserve it and make sure you get that done so this is a very important understanding that we all need to have okay now we have come to the important part of writing a paper i'm going to switch few slides before and compare the difference between reading a paper and writing a paper when it comes to reading a paper we read the algorithm uh, sorry we read the keywords first then abstract conclusion the last part of the introduction experiments and results and discussion but while writing a paper you will see an exact opposite phenomena and algorithm first in your paper you will write your experimental part say for example um let's give me a funny example for this as well uh say for example you're making an omelet uh you know you need eggs onions uh chili if it is india especially the south india more chili powder and pepper all these things together this is your experiment part and you know it and it's very easy to write it write that first you know this is your first step of encouraging yourself to write a paper number 2 you know the experimental uh, uh, results when you know the experiment part when you have some results you actually understand how you acquired that results again to write the experimental uh, sorry the results part in a very effective way you need a good understanding of algorithm of how your technology works like i explained uh if i didn't understand this whole graph how my material interacted with the light bias temperature and acetone i cannot write the results and discussion part you know in the results and discussion part i would say this happened uh just because these were the phenomena happening in my material so again reading literature survey plays a very important role in results and discussion i want to stress this point to you this is where the papers from the indian subcontinent africa and the middle east lag people say i did this and this happened but what the reviewer want this is not a, a novel this is not a story you know this is science all we want to understand what actually happened between those reaction how that reaction happened this is where uh, high impact papers come in if you don't know how to do this if you don't understand how to do this forget about publishing a paper in a high impact uh, journal 
So the crux, the basic phenomena, the basic physics, chemistry, the biology, and if we can also demonstrate that with your mathematical skills like equations, like relating it to the uh, the past invention, you know, this is the Einstein's equation, this is the Schrodinger equation, and this is what I tried. And when you try to generate a very interesting uh, comparison of those equations and your experimental results, comparing your theoretical experiments with your, uh, sorry, theoretical results with your experimental results, these are the things the scientific world wants to know. Um, Again, let me go back to the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. Uh, say, for example, no government or no uh, ethics committee would approve a medicine which is just a liquid. These scientists need to demonstrate what are the reaction it's going to do with the body, what are the body parts it will target, um, how this medicine is made, how such reactions are happening with our body, and how does it uh, increase or induce the immune system in us to fight the COVID-19. So if you don't under, uh, understand or if you don't explain this, then this is not science at all. This is, this is That paper would just be a novel. Okay, so you write your experimental part, results and discussion, then you're good to write your conclusions. You know, this is what I did and this is what I got and all the journals have a certain limit of conclusions. So don't try and highlight the important things um, of your paper. Now you write abstract introduction. Um, I'm going to deep dive into this abstract part now and we'll come back to the others later. Okay, the importance of a title. You know, in India, uh, there's quite a lot of numerology, um, and there's other sign, uh, astrology involved in naming a child. But in science, there are only very few techniques involved. Number one, you need to have a title that's really attractive. Trust me, if you see, uh, if we compare this with our real world life, uh, these cinemas that's coming with really insensible, at the same time, uh, uh, titles that makes no sense. Race three, race four, a doom a chale, what, what, what not? So in science, at times, you know, it, it is needed. You need to have a very attractive title. When the reviewers see it, I'm talking from Albert Einstein perspective. That's the reviewer's perspective. When the, when the reviewers see it, he need to think, oh, that looks different. Maybe he have done something different. At the same time, you can't have a really insensible titles like the movie titles. Some name that demonstrate your research in a very sensible way with uh, six to 10 words. That should be your target of your title. You can't have a really too short title or a too long title. Um, make sure it also convey the idea about your research. Okay, when I write titles, what I do is I write 10 titles, you know, in a different chronology. And I discuss with all my lab mates, my professors, and somehow I choose the best name um, out of out of everyone's suggestions and, and and my own intuitions. And sometimes when my paper get rejected, I also change the titles from one submission to another, um, depending upon you know the time and the comments from the reviewers. Um, there was one time a reviewer sent me a, uh, a review saying that your title make absolutely no sense, but your work is good. If you change your title, I might consider this for a review. So immediately we change the title and send it back. And other important technique, you know what we do as a reviewer, when we receive a paper, the first thing we do is we cut, copy, paste the title and put on Google. If the Google have trouble finding names like that, then we sort of tend to think maybe this is a very novel research nobody have really published. Say, for example, when people say, oh, zinc titanate uh, application for photovoltaics, when I cut, copy, paste this title into Google, unfortunately, there's hundreds and hundreds of papers. And immediately I think, oh, maybe this is not a novel research. So <clears throat> be very, very, very careful 
in uh, naming your paper. Very important, as important as your naming your child. Now, here you see zinc catenate nanorays with superior optoelectrochemical properties for Google, uh, chemical sensing. When I was naming this title, literally I sat for three days, keep on changing the terms. That I came to a point that Google couldn't really find out anything. So this is what you got to do. Sit and play with Google and its artificial intelligence. Sometimes um, Google is much smarter than us, but humans are much, much smarter than Google. You got to beat it on this game. So, so that's what I did. Now, uh, the other thing I told you is your keywords. While you're reading papers, I said you check the keywords first. This is how the future generation will identify their research and your relevance to them. When you have, say for example, look at my keywords, acetone sensing, amperometry, light assisted bias, and zinc titanate nanorays. A person who does acetone sensing will find my paper very relevant. A person who does amperometry, light assisted bias, or zinc titanate nanorays will immediately read my paper. Even if they're not doing all of them together, there is certain amount of information for them in all these terms as separate. Say for example, when somebody is doing research on bias, and when they type in Google bias assisted gas sensing, immediately my paper will show up and they will find my paper relevant. So this is when you also get citations. They will cite my paper. When you coin your keywords appropriately, you are rooting for citations. You are advertising yourself to the research fraternity. So make sure, make sure you have a strong um, keywords. So with that, we will have a short uh, five minutes break um, and we'll come back to discuss the rest. Thank you very much.
Okay. Um, welcome back. You all might have uh, been seeing me really aggressive in the last part, just because, you know, I thought it's it's really important to emphasize the importance of uh, a literature survey and understanding the science behind um, science behind any experiment or anything we do. But the second part is going to be really calm and I'll be talking like, you know, a melody song, uh, just because it is very important to grasp all these ideas with with a long term intentions and uh, our devotion towards it. So we will keep it very mild and you will see me quite calm on this session. Um, okay, now we discussed about the importance of title. Then we also discussed about the importance of keywords. Um, the title and keywords are your Aadhaar card or your identifier or your national security or your passport. Um, when you have this right, I think the further steps would be right. As soon as the reviewer think the name is very novel and Google cannot find out, he ticks your first tick. Okay, then he go check the keywords. And when he finds those keywords useful, again, he say, okay, this guy is uh, okay. Let me read his abstract. Before that, there's one thing the reviewer check in which organization this paper has come from. Has this people have any uh, international collaborations or national collaborations? You know, what does it does is it put a lot of credibility into your paper. Um, exa for example, if you have collaborated with a professor in IIT or NIT or somewhere from a foreign of origin, the reviewer tend to think, okay, so possibly I can I can consider this is a good work because this is a collaboration between two intellectual uh, minds. Um, so it is very very important to have collaborations and. The most important part of a collaboration is you share knowledge. You may not have certain uh, infrastructure in your lab or in your university. You can actually go do those experiments um, in their lab. Uh, say for example, this is again, it comes to having a thorough literature survey. When you read a lot of papers, you will know which group has what sort of facilities. And one day, when you are doing a certain research, uh, results to uh, research, you can email them and ask them, uh, "Look, professor, I am doing this research, and I am also thinking it would be interesting um, to look things from your perspective. So, can we run some experiments parallelly to compare our results uh, so that we can publish a really high impact uh, journal together?" So, this is a very important strategy that you need to. Uh, address and have collaborations. Okay, now I said your title is good, your keywords are good, you have some collaborations, not necessarily, but if you have, that is an advantage. Uh, what I did, you can see I collaborated with one of my friend in France from University of uh, Boradex, and I also collaborated with uh, Australian National University. Uh, Professor Antonia Tricoli is one of the very renowned person in my area of research. As soon as a reviewer sees his name, um, you know, there's always, oh, if the, if it is from Antonia, probably this is a good work. And again, Wojtek, uh, Suresh, Enrico, all are very renowned researchers. So the reviewer also feel comfortable that there, there will be definitely no fake data or this paper is of stand, a standard when they see good names in the paper. Okay, now we come to abstract. Abstract is another tricky thing. Like I told you, when you're reading the paper, the first thing you do is you read the abstract. 
So your abstract is like the trailer of a movie. Um, when the trailer is good, a lot of people think, oh, I might want to go watch this movie. So if you write a really efficient abstract, a um, lot of people would like to read your paper and cite your paper. That's where your success come from. Even from a reviewer's perspective, the reviewer, when he finds the abstract right, he thinks, oh, okay, this is a good paper. Let me publish this. And I'll also tell you something. Um, you know, it's very unfair, but I'd like to share this uh, open heartedly with you. Sometimes some reviewers, they get so many papers, so many, so many papers, you can't believe. What they do is they just read the abstract first and then they pass that paper to somebody else in the lab uh, to, to further read it. You know, when a paper comes to a young student or young researcher like me, what we do, we get completely over enthusiastic and read every single line and try to find mistakes from that paper. Um, you know, it's it has two reasons. It's It has a lot of politics as well. When I do that, my professor think, oh, Sultan do a good review job. So we got to give him uh, more research funding, things like that. Or it's, it's a way of showing my capability to him. So again, you know, if a paper come to me, I usually do a postmortem. I completely uh, scratch everything of the paper. Uh, when I go to my professor, my professor say, look, you can't do this. You know, I read the abstract. The abstract is good. And I decided uh, to accept this paper for publication. But you can have some mild comments on the paper, important uh, things that will be addressed. You can't go like Shakespeare uh, reading is, was, there, and then. So, so if you manage to impress somebody with your abstract, that is your third tick for publishing a paper. I at least do 10 corrections with my supervisors and my colleagues when I write an abstract. It is a summary of what my research is, why I've done it, and what are the new findings. These are the most important thing. It should be a standalone text. What was done? Why did you do it? And what did you find? If you manage to summarize all these things in uh, five to six lines, then again, it's a good abstract. And make sure you also be cautious about um, um, the word length or uh, the word count for every journal. Every journal has a different word count. So keep eye on that as well. You know, the whole review process is you keep the reviewer happy, you give them less job and they are happy. If you if if their word count is 250 and you're writing abstract of 350 or 300, the reviewer gets really angry. He th he thinks that this guy hasn't even read the basic uh, protocol of publishing in this journal. And sometimes they get rejected if they are nice and if they find your abstract nice, they write to you and say, you know, change the words in the abstract. Okay, I introduce you to Shakespeare. Well, I didn't introduce you. We all were introduced to uh, Albert Einstein, but now it's time for me to introduce you to Shakespeare. I'll tell you something, keep this in your mind and don't get disheartened. Even if Shakespeare write a research paper, the reviewer will say, this English is bad. I don't know, I don't know, I don't understand this at all. Um, I have people who uh, did PhD in Cambridge, Oxford, who I work with, even when they write papers, who is of native English, they the reviewers say your English is bad. So, you know, it's really funny. So don't get disheartened. Um, but make sure you perfectly abstract with good English as much you can. Um, so from now, whenever you're going to see Shakespeare, that's where you got to be very careful about your English skills. And if they say your English is bad, you have to accept that. You know, we can't do much. You can't go argue with them like, um, you know, my English is good. I went to a convent matriculation school. No, that doesn't work like that. You just pretend like you change certain words here and there and make it look like better. Um, I'll tell you something. This uh, I'm not being racist or anything. Once I received uh, a feedback from Taiwan, uh, we sent a paper to him and um, somehow the paper got passed into a professor. His English was so bad, he couldn't write a few basic sentences. 
but still he told me that my english was really bad so just ignore that and this is how this entire world of publication works sometime and especially if they see a paper from india or from africa or the middle east the first thing is default they will say uh, you got to review your english first so do something you know read your, it it gives you an opportunity to read your paper one more time and make some modifications here and there okay what is i'm going to talk again a reviewer's perspective um, when a reviewer receive a paper it also depends on the mood of the reviewer um, the psychological state that he is in the amount of workload that he has whether he might be traveling sometime and he might review your paper sitting on an airport wifi so um his personal things like if he has a problem with his family and unfortunately that's the day he take your paper and he he doesn't find your abstract nice title nice keywords nice even before going into the experiment part and other things he might reject you so don't get disheartened this is um, unfortunately a sad truth in the field of research that you know there are careless people as well so it doesn't mean your research is bad okay again we talk about citation citation citations yeah the most cited researcher is uh, considered as the most successful researcher so when it comes to citations first if your most of the uh, journals allow you to choose your reviewers say for example you have chose me as your reviewer what you have to do unfortunately unfortunately choose some of my again you will send a paper of my relevance so choose some of my papers as uh, and cite them put it in the introduction so what i do some people they some reviewers they go and check if they if you have cited them as well so when they see three four of their paper is cited just like oh if i accept this paper i'm going to get four citations so which is again should shouldn't be in science should never be uh, a part of a healthy academic environment but this is how the world works um and don't do that i i i always been very cautious if someone cite my name i make sure if that citation is genuine if that is required even if the paper is of not good quality and they have cited me i have always brave enough to reject those papers because i never wanted those citations it's more like a bribery unfortunately um so this is something uh, you got to be aware of if you are genuinely cite your researchers this will be my my advice if their papers make more relevance to you cite it um okay while you're choosing a reviewer you got to be a bit careful as well if you have done an extraordinary research and you want to challenge someone who is a king in your field you tell them like i have done a work which is as good as uh, you can you review me there are some genuine people there are quite a lot of genuine people in academia where they carefully read it and advise you and also they help you to publish because they want to encourage science but there are some people they doesn't like it they 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 certainly think oh he's a competition so i want to reject his paper or he's doing something extraordinary so these sort of things happen around the world as well i'm trying to be uh, very cautious with you in explaining all these things so that you get cautious about these things sometimes it is always good to choose a reviewer who is have done some work in your area but not really an expert in your area say for example i i know gas sensing pretty well at the same time i also work on catalysis water splitting uh, photovoltaics uh, water purification and uh, uh, and also a bit of uh, mass spectrometry as well but if you see mass spectrometry and photovoltaics i am not an expert but i do have an idea if you choose me as a reviewer what i will do <clears throat> i won't be able to ask really tough intelligent technical questions to you probably i will read the abstract introduction experimental setup and whatever results you have presented i might be able to ask you some questions but not those critical questions that you are not able to address so this is one strategy that you can uh, practice to choose a reviewer who is not completely 
in your area of research, but he have done something on your research. And at the same time, if you publish, uh, if you cite a couple of his papers, he get very happy. So this is one dirty way that works in the in the field of research. But unfortunately, not everyone is like that. There is a, a small percentage of people like that. So this is all the tricks in choosing a reviewer, reviewer and also citing some of your reviewers' work. Okay, again, um, Shakespeare come into play here. There's a free software called Grammarly. Uh, Grammarly helps you to identify basic grammatical errors. It's and it's free. You can also choose to go on to a premium version if you like. And this Grammarly has a technical version as well, where you are commanded to examine your draft in a technical way. It gives you a lot of suggestions, which will actually save a lot of time for you and save you from the reviewer's comment of, uh, oh, your English is bad. So start to use Grammarly. You will definitely enjoy. Um, when I write emails to important people, when I draft uh, proposals, I use Grammarly. And sometimes it identify the mistakes that I never thought I would make. So use this tool. OK, this is mainly for professors and assistant professors or somebody reviewing your paper. You know, we play too much on WhatsApp, Facebook, all these apps, but I think we haven't played too much and explored the potential of PowerPoint and Word and other softwares that are available. Excuse me. So I'm going to share some of uh, my documents, how my supervisors actually review my papers. Say, for example, there is an option called review mode. OK, here you go. This one paper that I'm trying to publish recently, you can see my supervisor read every single line. And he sometimes tell me, you know, add these references or he tells me that this makes no sense. You know how to do that? Go to reference, sorry, uh, review. And there's an option called new comment. Click that and say there is a grammatical error or you can rewrite it definitely. This is an absolute record of conversation between you and your student. You know, when you read his paper, it's very easy to comment on the side. You know, this doesn't look right. Uh, there is a mistake. Um, something is not accurate. Maybe this reference will be uh, good. So all sort of suggestions on the way. If you see my supervisor reads every single line. Uh, look, he, he has even changed uh, text. He even uh, correct me and say like, oh, use this sort of words. You know, this builds so much bond between you and your student, especially when your student write your first paper, make sure you uh, do corrections to him in a review mode so that this is documented. He understands it. He understands your expectation and he will not do a similar mistake like that uh, in the future. So, so um, review mode is something I would strongly suggest to bring into the culture. And even while you're sending a paper to your supervisor for review, you can actually write, you know, I wrote these comments. I wrote this part, but I'm not very sure what I'm writing or I didn't understand. Can we discuss this? So it's like a conversation between you and your supervisor through a document. So start this. This will be a really an effective tool for uh, communicating communication between you and your student. And be a very harsh reviewer by yourself. You know, I, I am a very harsh reviewer to myself. Whenever I write my paper, I read it in a perspective perspective of a reviewer. So every line I draft, I think how the reviewer will understand it. How will he perceive it? Um, then I give it to one of my colleague in my group. 
and i also stress one thing just because he read my paper i never add him as a uh, author anybody who contributes scientifically to my paper i add them in my paper but someone who read my paper who give suggestions who make english comments i always acknowledge them in my paper then telling them they read my paper to increase um the the readability of the paper so this is also again a verse culture uh, back in the indian subcontinent when someone read your paper they demand for um uh, an authorship which is the, which is which should never be a case you do not it is a scientific publication it's not a story book that you read the book and you tell like oh i was a co-author of it because i was reading it so only scientific uh, contribution should be rewarded okay so let me give you a, sh a short summary and then we will come again um to the 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 very important parts of uh, communicating with the reviewer i said a very strong literature survey then a very thorough experiments then we uh, were choosing the um title keywords writing a perfect abstract and you're also discussing everything with your supervisor in a review mode then you use grammarly to identify all the basic mistakes that um your your paper could uh, actually uh, uh, resolve by yourself then cover letter cover letter is really really important when it comes to um um publishing a journal since we all are above 18 and adults um i would like to tell this put it in a different way it's like a love letter you know to the reviewer um what you do is you say that i have this qualities that qualities and these are the things that i have done and i hope you will like my paper so but you make sure you do not cut copy paste your abstract what people does is dear reviewer and again the review my name is wrong you know me my name is like really long name six and what they do is they spell my name right or wrong or they write uh, not the complete name or something when i see that i feel like ah oh, this guy doesn't even know my name or what are you going to do so and some people do what they say is like uh, write my name wrong and then they say oh, here is my abstract please consider my paper for publication this is what they do this actually really makes a reviewer very angry um but what you have to do it's again like similarly like an abstract but not really cut copy paste your abstract you explain things in a different way um please do not have any spelling mistake do not repeat your abstract make sure the reviewer's name is right uh, avoid careless mistakes what some people do i see the date wrong because they edited one of their old um uh, uh cover letter and it was in 2000 i received a paper a week ago the date was uh, 9 9 2012 that was 8 years ago so please don't make this sort of mistakes um i'll show you one of my cover letter i hope that will be helpful and i will also send you through this cover letter so you can see uh professor name date proper name i've told them like these are the uh paper i have attached this signature properly aligned a nice draft of letter so this is what you got to do which will actually impress the reviewer and he will consider reading your paper now sometimes you can also tell your reviewer say for example your paper got rejected in the first submission you can tell the reviewer that my paper was rejected by this journal and these were the comments from them and i have made some adequate uh, uh changes so that the quality of the manuscript has improved remember remember one thing we all see rejection as a failure no rejection is definitely not a failure rejection is an opportunity to in, in improve your knowledge and also increase the quality of your paper 
um, every time my paper got rejected, I always did more experiments or more corrections or more changes in how I wrote the manuscript or changes in explaining how uh, the experiments were done. Sometimes the professors really don't understand how your experiments were done, what you're actually trying to say. Because in the Indian subcontinent, we also have a habit of completely translating our mother tongue to English, which will not make any sense to a foreign reader or to a reviewer. So it's okay to tell them that your paper was rejected by this journal and these were the feedbacks and I made all these corrections. Now, when your paper gets rejected and you do more experiments, there is a high chance it will go to a high impact journal. So never look at rejections as rejections. There's always a stepping zone and also it is an opportunity to improve your uh, quality of the manuscripts. And you also make sure when you complete writing the paper, put that paper in a um, in an email, send it to all the authors. Make sure all the authors read it and they tell your perspective because one could be an expert in a field, one could be an expert in the other field. So you get an impact input of all of them so that the quality can be significantly improved. Um, so these are the very important thing that you got to do. And sometimes you can also tell in the cover letter that um, I have uh, this professor, this professor who, who is an expert in the field. So I hope his contribution will be an uh, value to the field of science. So this is how we write this, you know, cover letter come love letter to a reviewer. Okay, now response letter after corrections. So what happens is first step is a cover letter when they reject you or when they give you feedbacks, you got, uh, when, when there is a rejection, it's a clear rejection, but when there are feedbacks or amendments required, you again write another, you tell them, dear professor, thank you very much for your feedbacks. These were the comments from you. These are uh, addressed and a separate document is attached of with the corrections that I made. In case, if you add a new author who actually did some more exam, uh, sorry, scientific experiments for you, you tell them to the reviewer that I have added uh, Dr. Tarini just because she contributed um, to the to enhance the quality of the paper. So, response letter is again you communicate with the reviewer, telling him that you may you have made all sort of uh, uh, corrections that he requested. Now, I'm going to go back and show you one of my response that I wrote to the reviewer. Okay, this one, the reviewer said, there is a spelling mistake in one of your author's name. I told him that I have corrected that. And they said, oh, the, the, you have labeled wrong. I said, I have corrected that. He asked for a table of content graphic. I've added that. And he asked me, reduce your references. I had like 100 references. He told me to reduce it to below 70. I said the references are reduced to 67. Uh, and he asked me to change the title, the first word of, uh, the first letter of every word of my title to capital. I did that. So formatting is different. That's one document. Now, when it comes to scientific review, um, one second. Okay, here you go. Scientific review. Look. This paper was read by one of my friends who actually work in Oxford University. He's a British guy, and I find his writing extremely mind-blowing. So what he did, he read my paper, and he changed quite a lot of words. The first comment from the reviewer, English may be polished in the revision. So I said, oh, yes, I have corrected the English, but actually I didn't do much. I made few corrections here and there. Then this reviewer, he asked me to cite some of three of his paper. You know, I was not ready to bribe him, but he wanted bribery. 
so i had no choice and he also convinced me that uh, um these papers are relevant uh, to your publication so i had all these papers then he started asking me so many questions <clears throat> you can see i have given a clarification to everything he asked at the same time i also comment the following text is added to the manuscript in page number 8 and which part experimental part so the reviewer will not go into your paper the first thing he will do he will read your uh, comments here and he will go cross check everything there so this document is extremely extremely important to maintain and this is the second step uh, you add how you formatted this uh, manuscript how you have addressed all the comments and you also write another letter in return telling him these are the comments that's been made okay so we we had uh written a very nice uh, cover letter now there are so many other things that you can add into your paper in order to enhance the quality of the paper number 1 i told you word and powerpoint we haven't explored its importance look this was one of my table of contents and a figure that explains how does my technology works i made this in word and look how beautiful it looks i can't claim my own work beautiful there so many people have told me that you know this figures are really beautiful so try make really good figures like this you know sometimes the reviewer go see this and he thinks like okay it looks like a good work and even when they have so many points to reject you these sort of good things will also uh, give you an opportunity to to be on the board so make beautiful figures which is also very important in science you know um, albert einstein said if you can't explain what you have invented you haven't invented anything if you if you can't explain something to your grandmother you haven't understood what you have invented your grandmother probably never went to school so you should be in a position even to explain science to an audience who is not from a science background so these sort of figures really helps trust me as a reviewer i love when people send such figures to me okay and there's another free software called blender completely 100% free and there are 10 tutorials in youtube if you manage to observe the 10 tutorials you can make amazing figures like this so i have a friend his name is ahmed who is an expert in making all these figures and he is an expert in blender so sometimes people ask him to make this sort of schematics and add him as a co-author in the paper so if you if one person in the group manage to uh, master this sort of tricks um, you know which will increase the quality of the paper so use blender it's really useful uh, this is one of my research look i have explained it how i synthesize my materials first i had a seed layer and a tertian layer then i grew zinc oxide nano arrays then i coated the zinc oxide nano arrays with titanium then i annealed the zinc oxide titanium core shell to 650 degree centigrade for an hour which became zinc titanate ztntio3 just by this figure i would be convincing the reviewer that uh this is my experiment this is the power of blender and image talk very extensively about supporting information in the coming time uh so make good graphs like this this is one of my paper in uh, again american chemical society this also one of my paper in american chemical society and i made all these graphs now but nowadays i really enjoy making these graphs you know for the first time using origin could be hard but as as time goes on it is really a very useful tool okay now 
um, having a, a literature survey, we have to tell the reviewer that I have done something better. Unfortunately, the world of science sometimes is a marketing platform that you got to continuously give a shout that I am better, I am better, I have done something, I am different. So what you can do, you can compare the literature of others, references are very important, and put your material or your invention and say this is my work and this is how I have increased the efficiency in comparison to others. So this is something you have to do uh, for a high impact publication. Going back to this slide, we discussed how to do the experiment part with figures. We also discussed um, the results and discussion part, not just as graphs, but as um, the hypothesis behind it. I told you how to write an ab abstract. Now I come to the introduction part. The introduction part is the most difficult part to write, and that should be the last thing that you do uh, in writing a paper. Um, first, you have to tell them why you have done this work. Number two, you have to bring some background uh, references to support that this is a proper science. This is where the papers from 60s, 70s, 80s, the fundamental inventions play a very important role. Books play a very important role. <clears throat> That's where you find the basic science. Uh, say for example, I uh, I have done some research in, uh, research in Schottky and Ohmic barriers, where I have to go back to some papers published in the 1970s um, pull them out and say these are my reference because that was the time those uh, inventions were uh, quite progressive. Then you do not discuss results at all. You do not dis discuss results at all. You have to create a curiosity. Like I told you, if abstract is the trailer of the movie, there's a new trend these days. There's something called Teresa. Uh, you know, a media of uh, a video or a motion image of uh, 30 seconds. That's what your last part of your introduction is about. You got to tell them, oh, this is what this research is about. These are all the background. And this is what I'm trying to do and I have achieved this. But you will not disclose any results. If you disclose results, there will be no difference between your results and a discussion part and your introduction. Just tell them that I have done this. And finally, you clean up. Clean up means English mistakes, uh, references right, format right, and all those basic things. So this is the algorithm to write a paper. Experiment, results and discussion, conclusion, abstract, and I have told you how to write an introduction. So we go back again to where we were. Okay, turn 10. Uh, plagiarism, plagiarism is a major problem. You know, people read paper, very good. People sometimes take texts from others. That's okay because science is science. You know, you can't, you have to accept somebody's uh, basic uh, scientific uh, uh, inventions, but you're not exactly right the way they have written. You can't just cut, copy, paste into your paper. You can take that material, paraphrase it in your style, uh, in your way of writing, or that research in relevance to your research, but you can't just cut, copy, paste. But we have a very efficient tool, uh, reviewers. You know what the reviewers do? First thing that cut, copy, paste your uh, um, um, title. The second thing, they cut, copy, paste your abstract. Third thing, they put your entire document into a software called Turnitin. Uh, what this Turnitin will find, it is also an artificial intelligence software which will find every single word that copied from what sort of sources. But plagiarism is a misunderstood concept um, in the, in the uh, Indian subcontinent and Africa. What some people think is when, they, when the software points to you,
some corrections like this, you can see it's not a plagiarism. If your plagiarism is less than 15%, it is completely acceptable. Uh, because look, introduction is a word, is a universal word, but still it finds a reference for that and say you copied introduction, but I did not really copy this word. Um, and you can also see a complete line is not marked rather than some words are marked. If a complete word is a sentence is marked like this, complete sentence like three, four lines all together, it means you have copied it from where, uh, from somewhere the reviewer will not like it. Trust me, I copied this from my previous paper and it actually founded my, although it is my own work, although it's my previous words from my previous paper, <clears throat> still it's not acceptable by a reviewer because the reviewer will not go check whether it's my paper or somebody else's paper. When you see a wholesome amount of uh, uh, marking like this, he will think, oh, this guy is a copycat, probably has copied it from somewhere. But as I go on, you can see there's not much of words. There are few words here and there, which is not really plagiarism. Say, for example, this word called adsorption, desorption is a, a universal word. Molecules on the surface, surface universal word. This software even point out figures, which is also a basic universal word like performance under 365 nanometer UV light. These are all not plagiarism. Uh, this is how the software works. But if you see something like this, a whole paragraph, which I copied from my previous paper, it is definitely a plagiarism, no matter whether it's your own work or somebody else's work, the reviewer will not like this. So what I did, I completely paraphrased it. I completely rewrote it in a different way until the all the plagiarism went away. So plagiarism, you got to do it three times while writing a paper. Number one, as soon as you wrote a paper. Number two, um, once you made few basic corrections. Number three, before sending it to the reviewer. So you got to do at least three times and make sure you bring it down to less than 15%. Oh, supporting information, very, very important thing uh, to do. I'll tell you a very interesting thing very quickly. Uh, we've been trying to do something and in a collaboration and we tried that in 100 different chemicals. And finally, we tested it in water and we were able to achieve it. So what about this 100 days or, sorry, it was not really 100 days, it was more than 100 days where you test it, you characterize it, what to do? You know, is that not useful? Then one of my professor advised me, put all that 100 materials in the supporting information and write about the water that you got results. So I wrote a complete paper on how I achieved it through water in just three pages, just three pages. But this three pages paper had a supporting information of 100 pages. To what the, the only one line that I said that in order to achieve this, we tried this in 100 different compounds and it wasn't successful. The results of the 100 different experiments are in the supporting information. When you go to the supporting information, Every page had all the figures, results, how the chemical experiment was done. So the scientific fraternity really appreciate this. You know, they will not do the same mistake of what I did. I'm sure anybody who identified that paper and read that paper would have a complete knowledge that this reaction will happen only in water, but not with any other chemistry. By that way, he saves time and chemicals and everything. So have a very strong supporting information. And also sometimes uh, reviewers don't uh, tend to trust some of the results. When they find some graphs are a bit, uh, you know, cliche or crinky, they, what they will think is, oh, probably this is not a real graph. But when you show your experimental setup, when you show how you did it in a proper way, in a supporting information, which will actually convince him. So what I do every time I publish a paper, I put this gas sensing setup of me in the review paper, uh, sorry, in the supporting information. I even show them how the block diagram of my sensing setup is. And this is one of my uh, 
experimental method which i which i drew using powerpoint i put it so what i do is show everything to them so that they have no doubts on me which is also a way of convincing the uh, reviewer okay i think that's all the tips i have for you but let me summarize it before i move into a bit of philosophy and a bit of psychology um number 1 you read your literature thorough you should be the master of your research professors and supervisors make sure you push your students and really be harsh with them on this matter do not compromise this on that that one hour of presentation every two months in the first year of phd should definitely be there and this group meetings asking them what they have done in the past week should definitely be there this is the one thing that you have to be really really strict and but you can relax lot other things um number 2 while writing a paper identify a proper title keywords make sure you write an abstract that is a stand alone text do not cut copy and paste your abstract into your cover letter make sure you write you do experiments in your full capacity in a perspective what a reviewer could ask me later um also um also you um, make sure you write a, a proper cover letter use origins uh, use tools like uh, uh turn it in uh, excuse me just give me a moment i'll be back in a second uh apologies my housemate started vacuum the house uh, started distracting me a little bit um i'm sorry about that um what you do is use n note origin and use grammarly um and other softwares and you make sure everything is done perfectly now these are the things that i learned in the past and i have shared everything with you uh even from a reviewer's perspective and certain things that not many people will talk um openly uh about how the world of uh, review citation works um don't worry always have a uh, high hopes and um make sure you always um amend the corrections from the reviewers in a right way if someone rejects you that's not the end of the world you can actually do lot of additional data and publish it in a better way always look for collaborations open for collaborations um these are the most important things that uh, we need to keep in mind and these two things that's always missing in the papers that i receive from the indian subcontinent number one is the conflict of interest you always have to write this at the end of your papers the authors declares that they have no conflict of interest and make sure before sending a paper to the reviewer you bring all the people involved in the paper together um in a email or in a discussion and have a chat how you are going to write it and you also acknowledge the the fundings and like i told you the difference between authorship and acknowledgement when someone reads your paper you always acknowledge them uh say for example dr blake polman is the person i i told from oxford university who always reads my paper i tell we also acknowledge dr blake polman for proofreading and significantly enhancing the quality of our manuscript and one one time there's a friend of mine uh she did a a small cad uh, drawing for me i also acknowledged her uh, i did not add her in the review because it was not a significant scientific contribution um move on it's it's always the the part of the game you know rejections um it's it's true to life itself not just about rejection of papers don't be disheartened this is the time supervisors have to be um be playing a very important role in uh, in encouraging your students when a paper is rejected you always tell them that's okay don't worry about it we will get it done from some way you know this this word 
will completely rejoy the the entire mood and encourage them to work further when you also talk a bit negative you know you know we didn't do this it actually bothers them and there's also a certain way my supervisors are really expert in that they say it's okay don't worry but they also point out sultan i asked you to do this you didn't do that so you know it's better to be careful in the future um the choice of words in in uh, criticizing your students okay and finally i would like to acknowledge these amazing people i never had an opportunity to work with a, a female supervisor um dr sundar from national university of singapore professor sri ram ramakrishna he is the uh, vice president of national university of singapore one of the most cited um researcher in the world professor michael f cromie university of california berkeley he publishes paper only in nature uh professor uda swingen shogal who is an expert in uh, theoretical and computational chemistry uh professor pedro di costa professor elia sabri dr kanjani uh, professor samuel james ipolito these are the uh eight men in my research career who always have nice things to say to me uh, not even a single day um they have discouraged me even when there is an advice or a, a warning it was in a positive way um uh, during my phd i got married i had a child my mother was very unwell so i have to fly to india several times uh, my supervisor has been extremely supportive i had all the facilities i had a really high paying scholarship even then there were times i couldn't handle the uh, the pressure of the phd but my supervisors were always there nobody else would really understand you you know uh, when you travel on a train or a bus or a, when you meet new people when you tell them that i'm a phd student the first question they ask is like oh that's amazing what is your phd is about and we all don't like to answer this because we've been telling that to everyone but they don't understand the real technical trouble financial trouble psychological trouble a student go through but your supervisors definitely understand that so please be very kind um uh, publishing a paper or uh, passing a phd is not the end of the world um a phd is a learning to innovate something in science i think we all have to look at it that way that's how i look at it um but saying all these things i am a very harsh person when it comes to literature survey i make sure people do a very strong literature survey when it comes to their research and i keep on telling them that's your responsibility uh, my supervisors have stood with me in the lab late nights to do experiments so i acknowledge and thank all of them and i also acknowledge all my teachers uh, from my high school undergrad everywhere and i thank uh, um crescent college for this amazing opportunity um uh, dr uh, dr azad the registrar dr raja mohammed dean of academic research uh, dr najmun sa jamal dean school of electrical sciences dr tarni uh, chandra prakasham hod electronics department i have a very special bond with tarni madam uh, always her warm communication support has encouraged me um and we tell all the time we share uh, and tell each other that we got to do something to this uh, society through our knowledge so i thank tarni madam for all her warm communications and support encouragement and i thank uh, i got to know hasan uh, yesterday was helping me with the logistics and the technical thing i thank him for uh, the successful uh, event and ramesh kumar i know him for a while Uh, i thank him for all his support and guidance in this uh, entire webinar um and finally i thank all of you uh for participating in this webinar okay there's one thing that changed my life and there's few special people in this in my life when i was when i was um 19 years old i did a research in um, um rocket science and i went to um china to present this paper and i got the best paper award in the tnt and balti conference 
which actually motivated me. So encourage your students to participate in conferences. And um, the, the chairman of Crescent Engineering College, Mr. Abdul Kadir Buhari, uh, funded my flight tickets. This was uh, 10 years ago. Um, and today, uh, the person who I am is those good people's effort and support. So I thank all my teachers in this pursuit. Um, I usually respond to emails in 24 hours. I I do not see who is emailing me, uh, what is uh, what is being asked. I try and help them as much as I can. Here's my email address. Sultan Halifa Harun Al Rashid is my Twitter. I'm also starting a a new science communication company in India, which will speak science in at least 15 different languages. So follow me in Twitter. <coughs> Sultan Halifa Harun Al Rashid is my Facebook name. If you like to communicate with me on Facebook, um, don't worry. I know uh, doing a PhD is not easy. Being in the field of science is not easy. We all will be fine. But trust me, we are better contributors to the society in comparison to an actor who is so famous. During this COVID time, I acknowledge the doctors, nurse, the sanitation workers, and the scientists who unconditionally uh, worked for the welfare of this nation. So maybe we are not popular, but we are the backbone of any economy and welfare of a nation. So now it's the time for you to ask question. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Syed. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. As usual, uh, you have rock and we have a lot of questions. Uh, we will be uh, uh, sharing it with you now. Uh, Ramesh? Yes, ma'am. Questions are ready, ma'am. Um, uh, Dr. Sultan, uh, the yeah. first question is from Nita Seri. Uh, how to identify the value of a paper when we uh, read a paper? Okay. So the value of a paper is the how much value it makes to you. No matter it's a paper in a really high impact journal, but if that paper doesn't give you any input for your research, that you put zero marks for that paper. So read the abstract, look at the keywords, and also check the title and go to the conclusion. This is when you will identify whether that paper will make any use to you. Then check whether it is a high impact paper or a low impact paper. Sometimes even a paper which is not in a high impact journal gives you more information. Con consider that as a knowledge source. When it comes to citing, make sure you find a similar paper like that and cite it um, uh, in your paper so that the reviewer will be very happy that this person is based on a citation from really good journals. I think that makes sense. Okay. Uh, the next question is from an anonymous user. How to prepare the paper presentation in competition level? How to? How to prepare the paper presentation in competition level? Okay. Uh, competition. Competition. It's to present or uh, to judge? Uh, probably uh, to present, I think so. Okay, okay. Um, I'll tell you something. I in when I in 2005, uh, in the first year of my undergrad, I won my first paper presentation. Um, you know, it was about uh, nanotechnology in, in uh, refrigeration. Um, so I I found a random paper of my interest. Uh, there's quite a lot of echo. Control that. Uh, it's echoing right now. Okay. Um, oh, I think a dog is barking somewhere. That's fine. Uh, so I identified a paper. In a paper presentation, they don't expect too much from you. All they see is how confident speaker you are. Uh, are you able to communicate um, uh, really uh, small things, or sorry, very technical things in a, uh, in a very efficient way to people? Um, if you all be patient to me in three minutes, I will show you my three minutes thesis video, which which I demonstrated uh, um, how complicated science in, in a very simple way. 
So a paper presentation is also relevant like that, but probably in 10 minutes. So please watch this video, and I'm sure you will find this very interesting. What comes to your mind when you see this image? Other than the fact an incredibly handsome guy blowing on a coffee bean. Why does he do that? We all love coffee. I'm sure we are careful about the amount of sugar that we add in our coffee. Do we ever consider checking the amount of sugar level in our blood? Yes, diabetes. Diabetes is an imbalance of insulin hormone that regulates our blood glucose level. Uncontrolled diabetes can lead to stroke, blindness, heart attack, kidney failure, and even amputation. According to World Health Organization, in 2017, 5 million people died out of diabetes. That's like one person died every six seconds. Australia have 2 million pre-diabetic and 500,000 undiagnosed diabetic population. Please be aware, you could be one among them. Is there an alternative for the, oh, the painful hand pricking blood sample? Would you believe me if I say, I can diagnose diabetes just from your breath? Human breath is one of the most complicated gas. It consists of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and other gases. When a person develops certain disease, certain gases are found in abnormal proportion. We can use it like a signature to identify certain disease. For diabetes, it's acetone. The amount of acetone in your breath is directly proportional to the sugar level in your blood. Higher the acetone concentration, higher the sugar level in your blood, and vice versa. The major challenge here is to identify the tiny concentration of acetone in your breath. It's like finding a precious pearl from the Pacific Ocean. I have developed a new type of sensor, which is much smaller than that coffee bean, consisting of billions of nanoparticles. These nanoparticles are powerful enough, can find your acetone from your breath in less than one second. All you have to do is just blow on my sensor and it tells you the diabetic condition on a daily basis. It can easily fit into your phone. We are seeking intellectual property rights. Realistically, I can make these devices in less than $20. On mass production, cheaper than a coffee. In 2040, there will be 640 million diabetic population. And this is the most awaited invention of the decade. Walk with me to my lab. Let's get your diabetes diagnosed. Thank you very much. So that was uh, three minutes. So a paper presentation is possibly uh, a 10 minutes presentation. So talk simple things, that's all. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, how, is it, how is it so difficult to publish a paper in uh, Scopus by Sukhulbak? What is the question again? Uh, Why is it so difficult how, to publish so difficult to your paper in Scopus? Well, that's all you heard from me today. I think if you implement uh, all the things that I told you, you can definitely publish a paper, not just in Cop uh, uh, Scopus, even in Nature as well. So check what where you're uh, lagging. Uh, I'll send it through the presentation to everyone. Make sure where you are lagging and uh, try to improve on those areas so it will never be a problem again. Identify your own inefficiencies and uh, become competent in those areas. That's all from okay. me. Yes, okay. Uh, next question. How to organize a paper for each publication? Uh, question from Mutu. How to organize? Uh, that is in the software organize? you were talking about. You were talking about the software. Yeah, no, yeah. Software, how to organize a paper for a particular publication. I don't understand the question. If you can be more elaborative. You were okay. talking about okay. software, Mendeley, and one yeah. more software on EndNote software. Yeah. Yes, so yes. You were showing uh, your publications you organized for your thesis. Now, yeah. in a similar way, how to organize the publications for a particular journal? That is what they are asking. Okay, okay. 
So when you download Mendeley and EndNote, there are different styles and fonts available for every journal. Say for example, it has almost for every single uh, journal from every single field that exists. You can download that font and add into your Mendeley or into your EndNote. So I'll show you that. You can see here when you go to files, uh, styles, sorry, I think edit, edit so styles, new style. You can actually go add uh, all the styles into it. So say for example, your paper got rejected in one journal. All you have to do is just click your word format and say, um, change this to applied materials and interfaces. Automatically, it changes the style and format. <clears throat> this way, you can quickly update your paper and send it to, um, to another journal rather than manually changing uh, things. Say, for example, your, I saw one of the question on the YouTube when, when a review asks you to cut down some of the references, what you do is just go delete that reference. Automatically, it get deleted in the manuscript and it get rearranged as well. So it's a sequential algorithm to organize this. So it's, it's just the efficient usage of that tool. That's all from me for this question. Okay. Uh, next question is from Sophia Ahmed. Um, my study is related to qualitative management in a particular sector. So while doing literature, literature review, shall I consider only that particular sector or shall I read the articles related to other sector and include in my study? Well, there is something called becoming a multidisciplinary researcher. Um, you need to have a general ten trend and idea of everything that's happening around you, but you got to be an expert in some field. Um, so it is good to have an idea, read few papers uh, in that area. It will also help you to collaborate itself because over a time when you do research in the same area for more than three, four years, you get bored. So when you have a general idea of things, you can move from one field to another um, quite easily. So it's it's okay to read something that you, you, you will not lose anything. That's all from me for this question. Okay. Uh, uh, next question uh, from Surjit Singh Bagal. What is the best way to find the literature? First way to find the literature is educate yourself what all the core areas, core papers. Number two, like I said, go read the keywords. That should be your first focus. Then read the title, read the abstract, read the conclusion. This should not take you more than five minutes. If that paper is useful and somewhere relevant to your work, even if you spend a whole day to read that paper and understand that paper, which is a well done, which is really good. But at the same time, within that five minutes, three to five minutes, if you don't find that paper interesting, um, I think you got to skip that paper and move on. And like I told you, you got to constantly check. You got to identify your uh, uh, um, competitors and constantly check their publications in their website. This is how you identify it, you know? And ma make sure you identify which are the research groups that do similar work like you and keep eye on them. This is how you identify uh, uh, literature in the latest trend. You know, some people, they tend to read papers before 10 years, 15 years, but not really focus on uh, the recent thing. What you can do is go to Google, Google Scholar. Google Scholar have this option. On the side, you type ZNO something. Um, here you see it's since 2020, 2019. Always go check 2020. What are the paper that came this year? You go read them. If, some, if that paper is very relevant to you, make sure you don't do a research similar like that and always cite those papers, recent papers. That's all from me. This is how you identify um, research papers. Okay. Uh, the next question, how to cite a paper from Dr. Rahul Meena? Cite a paper? Yeah. 
Okay, um, like I told you uh, previously, always when you're um, talking about fundamental research, cite those papers from from 60s, 70s, which is the fundamental core research. Um, um, so that's how you identify those basic literature. Then if you do a good literature survey, you will know what are the most important papers in your area of research and you cite them and make sure they are recent years and from good research groups and from a high impact papers. That's all from me for this question. Okay. Uh, next is from uh, Hamoud Mohamed. If I want to take a paragraph from my old published papers and involve it in my new paper, shall I write my old paper as a reference and follow the citation guidelines or no? Oh, yes, definitely you can do that. But if you're, you can reference to your old paper and say, uh, say, for example, I did a sequence of experiments which have strong correlation with each other. I did not spend time explaining that in my new papers. What I did, please reference my old paper, but I wrote few lines from that. You know, this is what I did, but I did not also copy those lines. I paraphrase it um, uh, here. Yes, you can always do that. That's all from me. Okay. Uh, next question from Jitendra Singh. Uh, what should be the ideal number of citations or references in our paper? or the length of the literature review section from the perspective of a publishing journal in operations research area? It completely depends from journal to journal. Say, for example, if you're writing a review paper, you can cite until 300 to 400 papers. Um, but some journals, they have limitations until 70, uh, 70 uh, references, 80 references. So you got to abide by the rules and regulations. Now, some journals they also have only 40 references this is where you you got to be really wise in choosing your references that's all for me okay uh, next question um just a minute okay uh what should be the target for plagiarism similar inductive while writing a review paper marif shah what is the question again what should be the target for plagiarism or similarity index while writing a review paper? Well, well, I said 15 to 20 is a good percentage. When it comes to a review paper, you always take text from other papers. You, you got to play a very smart game in paraphrasing it uh, and writing it in a very efficient English. So just because you're writing a review paper, you don't have an excuse of copying things from others' text. So paraphrase it efficiently and bring it down to 15. And by the way, in a review paper, you don't really write too much. You sort of bring figures and uh, uh, you put things in a, a ta tabular format. So this can be controlled. Yeah, so there's no excuse, even if it is a review paper, plagiarism is not welcomed in the field of research in publications. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question: Can we rely uh, can we rely on drill bit plagiarism software? Yes, I've heard about it, and uh, uh, yes, that's okay. You know, they 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 everyone is connected to the same database, so it's not really uh, which software, but at least you got to do that checkup. But in my opinion, I find Turnitin very efficient. Okay. Uh, next question is from Arthi Rawat. As a new research scholar, uh, which kind of paper is more likely to get published in high impact journals, qualitative or quantitative in the area of social sciences? Well, if you are a new researcher, uh, it is always important to have few good impact papers at the same time numbers as well. Say, for example, if you manage to publish a paper in Nature, one paper, which, which is equal to 50 low impact papers. So concentrate and focus more on uh, uh, more on publishing high impact papers. That's all from me. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, please suggest 
suggest some free softwares to check plagiarism from Kasala Mullah. Well, unfortunately, Turnitin and Drillbit are the two things I know. Uh, maybe you can Google it. Okay. That's all from me. Uh, next, okay. next one from Mebin Samuel. Uh, how do I ask an unknown professor or researcher from abroad universities to collaborate with me in a research paper? Oh, very interesting question. Most interesting question. Uh, trust me, I, I speak this from my uh, bottom of my heart. I, when I was applying for PhD abroad, I used to put thousand applications throughout the journey, at least 10 applications a night. So people in the research field, especially uh, in the Western world, everywhere for that matter, are really nice. They like to help people. They like to collaborate. What you have to do is tell the professor that this is what you're doing. And uh, I read some of your papers. They are very interesting. And I'm thinking if there is any possibility, we can collaborate. And possibly you will get an answer, yes. Because when it comes to uh, research, when it comes to the promotions of the professors, it is also an important requirement how many uh, collaborations that they have done. Um, you know, nobody appreciate a person who lives in a nutshell. Uh, so. But definitely they will communicate very warmly with you but you got to have a good choice of words you got to write things very efficiently you can't send them like 20 30 pages document you have to send a two page document explaining everything and what you want uh, in a really really efficient manner please write to me i will i will send you a few models of me com my communication with some professors so uh, there's additional information. After I finished my master's degree in, Singa uh, in Singapore and Amity University, I used to put at least uh, 10 applications a night. And finally, I had 12 PhD offers. Out of all the 12, I chose to come to Australia just because it's a very prestigious scholarship. So it's a it's lot of trial and error. And don't, don't get egoistic in this matter. If someone doesn't respond to you, it's okay. It's okay. You, you have to knock. If someone opens in, you go through, that's it. Otherwise, you got to ignore and be positively move on. I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, next question uh, from uh, uh, Hamoud Mohammed Al Rafi. Uh, some journals ask us to reduce the number of references. What can we do? Uh, we will fall in ethical issues uh, by uh, testing their knowledge, by testing their knowledge. Well, yes, I, I agree with you, but uh, you got to be um, you got to be very careful in choosing your references. And um, if they say, like, well, I have a lot of experience. When I had 100 uh, references, they have asked me to bring it to 40, uh, sometime to 70. So this is you as a person and you and your supervisor make wise decisions uh, who which reference to make and which not to. And if you can, where, where there is five references, if you can manage to find one paper that addresses all those five journals, all those five concepts, it's fantastic. And you will get there only when you read a lot of papers. That's all from me. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, give some tips on writing a review paper. Well, if you read a lot of papers, you can write a review paper. Very simple answer. You know, you, you, you read a lot, then you will come to a conclusion. I would like to convey a summary of all this information to the future generation. And you start to write a review paper. Simple process, but it looks complicated, but it's really not. That's all from me. Okay. A uh, question from Kesha. Uh, difference between conference proceedings paper and journal paper. Well, I explained to you, I had a very extensive uh, discussion on this, but I would like to emphasize <coughs> conference papers, you know, doesn't really has much value in comparison to a high impact publication. So don't really compromise your good data into conferences just because you want to travel to Australia or to America. If you have some data which you think is not really good and you cannot publish that in a, a good journal, put that into a conference, but build a nice story around it. You know, this is what I'm trying to do and this is some of my results. That's what a conference expect even. 
So this is what I used to do from my experience. Those data, which I don't think uh, it will be useful for anything, I put that in a conference. Okay. Uh, can you please refer any free scope percentage journal for science and multidisciplinary? What is that? Uh, uh, any Scopus Index Journal for Science and Multidisciplinary Research. Oh, well, that will be very misleading if I uh, quote few names because I don't really know what exact research is yours. Uh, that's something okay. you got to intensively do so. Okay. Uh, next question is from Monisha. Uh, how to choose a suitable journal to publish our work? Well, again, if you, if you read well, you will identify what are your core areas, core research journals, and uh, what sort of audience you're focusing. Um, then you can choose which journal you want to communicate. And at the same time, you check what is the impact factor, uh, how long that the paper take to publish. Say, for example, you are in the last year of PhD and you want some quick papers. Um, you can choose not to go for those journals which take a lot of time. So. You know, these uh, these details are available in the internet. So you can choose a paper that suits your situation at that point of time. Okay. Uh, next question is from Vineser Jabrani. How to identify your fake journals? Well, uh, what a question. I've never faced a question like this. <laughs> uh, you know what? You know what? If you have read some papers, quite a lot of papers, you will identify uh, uh, that some some journals are fake, some data is fake. Because just because by seeing the graph, you can identify that this is a fake graph. It's a manipulated one. So it comes by experience. It's uh, I cannot give you a microscope to find out which is a fake journal, but it comes with experience. For that, you got to read a lot. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, from why this current not disclosing the results and outcomes of the research in the abstract is must or an option. Can you go a bit slow, Mr. Ramesh? Yeah, not disclosing the results and outcome of the research in the abstract is a must or an option. In the abstract? Yeah. Well, if you see abstract, it's a very short uh, communication. Um, you can say really significant results in there, but you can't write paragraphs and paragraphs saying that what results you have achieved. Abstract is mainly uh, to say what what is the problem in two lines, what you have done in two lines, and what you have achieved in two lines. That's it. Okay. Yes, you can disclose, but not as extensively as the results and discussion part. Okay. Uh, last question. Uh, if the reviewer comments are general rather than specific to particular technical details or topic, it's required to do the complete experiment again. How to give response or answer to this type of comments from Syed Javid? Well, in my experience, I'm very sorry to say there are some reviewers who really ask very stupid questions. It means they haven't really understood what uh, your research is about or you haven't communicated in an effective way. If you think you have done the right thing and you can write back to him explaining that if he is not convinced uh, i think it's better to find another journal because uh, an experiment is like three to four months of work if you like to do that and you have the capacity to do that maybe you can consider do that if the reviewer asks you genuine questions so yeah sometimes to you know skip journal and move on Sometimes if those comments were really genuine, work on it and uh, try and publish it if that worth publishing in that journal. That's all for me. Okay, that's all the questions. Okay. Uh, now I request uh, Mr. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you once again, everyone, for your very active participation. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I request uh, Mr. Hassan Babu to uh, give the word of thanks.
can see from the chat box. Uh, we will be sending feedbacks to you also. Uh, wonderful hmm. session. Lot of feedbacks. Uh, have. See, uh, Ramesh is, uh, has posted. Audience were very much happy with your cooking. Wonderful. Thank you. I Thanks I'm for your support. Uh, I extend your cooperation in future too. We will work together in terms of research and you know uh, other aspects too. Wherever possible, we can collaborate. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Hassan sir, for your for your help. Thank you, Ramesh, for for all your support. Thank you. We have to thank you, sir. Yes, the Dean Academic Online, ma'am. Is he hearing me? Uh, sir is there on the line. Sir? Yeah, yeah. Dina, can I... Hello, sir. He's there, but muted. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Sir, are you able to hear us? Ah, yeah. He is texted. I am hearing. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your help. Thanks for joining me. Sir, can you unmute and I think he has some problem with his mic. Uh, he will be texting us. That's okay. No problem. Uh, he has messaged. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. And uh, um, we will see how it, uh, how the feedbacks and stuff. So hopefully, I think, uh, I think it was useful. Yes. 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 It was very much useful. Thanks for your time. No problem, ma'am. Thank you. Take I'm really sorry. Ma I'm really sorry. My housemaid started vacuuming in the middle. It's okay, not an issue. And we also we had some technical issues, unexpected difficulties. But anyway, your session was awesome. Uh, we managed to do very well. Thanks, Hassan and Ramesh. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Dean Sir, for supporting us uh, to organize this. Thank you all. And okay. it's uh, time for you to take rest. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I'll okay. see you guys when I come down to Chennai sometime. Yes, yes, definitely. You're always welcome. Thank you. Take thanks. care, ma'am. Yeah, thanks. Take care, you too. Thank Bye. you, Ramesh. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, Hasan. Bye, sir. Take care. Stay safe. Take care. Take care. See you. See you.